this. You can start speaking at least. If you're having an issue, I'll uh, so you're live right now. Okay. Um, and sure, yeah, the camera then might work there. So. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, so typically, Gabriela Cruz, our nurse educator and care coordinator, would be doing this presentation, but she's not um, at work today. So my name is Lauren Jennings. I'm the occupational therapist for the Eating Disorders Program. Um, I want to welcome you and thank you for participating in today's education series presentation. Today, we'll be hearing from Gwen Haworth. Um, she's talking about, um, and she is the education project manager with TransCare BC and formerly worked her five years as the LGBTQ plus educator with PRISM Services at Vancouver Coastal Health. She also worked frontline for nearly a decade with Rain City Housing and Support Society, focusing on harm reduction, self-determination, and low barrier access to housing, shelters, and services. Gwen is best known outside of Vancouver for her past film work, Primarily her feature documentary, She's a Boy I Knew, which screened internationally at over 100 film festivals and continues to be used in curriculum at post-secondary institutions across North America. So I'd just like to remind you of our question period at the end of the presentation. Feel free to type your questions throughout the presentation and I will read them out um, on your behalf during the question period. Thanks, Beth. Hi everyone and welcome and thank you so much for participating. Um, um, as Lauren stated, I work at TransCare BC, which is part of the Provincial Health Services Authority. I'm the Education Project Manager right now. And if you go to the TransCare BC website, there's a lot of resources and contact information on there now. Um, but we're hoping also to have a number of education-based um, um, initiatives in the next little while that are available in 2018 and 2019 and beyond that. Some of that will be online modules, hopefully health navigation guides, as well as uh, toolkits and so forth. We have a toolkit for primary care providers right now. Um, we're also working on one for mental health service providers, which should be released sometime in the summer of this year. Um, most of what I'm going to be talking about today is pretty much foundational stuff to think about when you're working with gender diverse folks, trans folks, folks who um, identify as non-binary, and recognizing that some people may be out about their identity, but many people are not, and often will not necessarily disclose that to somebody unless they feel that it's a safer space for somebody to do so. So thinking about the different places you work, I have two questions for you um, to think about when I'm speaking about really Trans 101 and um, some access best practices, um, to think about in terms of the places that you work. Um, the first one really is, this, how does this, what I'm going to be speaking about apply to your work? Um, site in terms of client access if you have someone access who may be out about their identity and for those who are not out and who may need signs that it is a non-judgmental safer space to address what may be going on for them the second question is just thinking about how may struggles around societal acceptance and self-acceptance of gender diversity impact an individual's relationship with their body especially if they identify as trans um, and or gender diverse um, and I'm definitely thinking both of folks who are out, but also folks who are not out yet, who are negotiating perhaps their body in, a, in, a, in, in, the, in their life where they feel they can't actually be out about stuff. And so looking for some sort of sense of control about who they are and how they express themselves in the world. So before I begin, I just want to mention a little bit about myself. I'm somebody who does identify as trans. I was assigned male at birth and my body developed in a way that we perceive male bodies to develop. But from a very young age, I identified as female. I kept that to myself until I was 27, when I came to a point in my life where I felt numb enough that I just felt that I could risk it, fearing that I may lose a lot of good people in my life. I'm Actually, fortunately, I did not lose most of those folks, which is wonderful and great. But it was only when I was working at Green City Housing Support Society that I also realized that the amount of access and privilege muted. Um, and felt like I could always access safety if I dare need to. But working at Rain City Housing Support Society, I met a lot of folks who were dealing with um, 
um, housing instability, um, poverty, um, stigma against folks uh, who are racialized, colonialism, um, stigma against poverty, substance use, and so forth. So thinking about that and thinking about access in situations when you're gender diverse um, um, and how sometimes service providers where you access services are perhaps the way to connect to some of our folks and opt back into much, much, much more substantial care that impacts your social determinants of health. So I'm going to move forward here and um, just say that two of the objectives are in this presentation that I have for you would be just identifying ways that you can enhance accessibility for your gender diverse clients and employees, recognizing that many of us do also hold jobs in the healthcare system and may end up working with or do actually work with you already. Um, secondly, consider how multi-pronged approaches can support all staff and clients in creating safer and more accessible services. If we have a policy but it's in an HR binder in the back of uh, some office and it's not really being accessible, um, folks that are working there and folks that are accessing your services are not necessarily aware about it. It doesn't quite help so much. So having visibility of that policy, having it available, having education and tiering folks um, who are residents, uh, folks who are working there can be really useful in making sure that these things get um, actually utilized. So I'm going to talk about three things um, quite quickly. I'm a fast speaker and I've had cough, so I apologize if I speak really fast during this. Hopefully um, there's Q&A time later to catch up. Um, but I'm going to talk about key concepts, barriers and impacts to access, and then some policy and practice. Now, the first key concept I just want to make um, everyone know is that mistakes aren't inherently bad. Um, I advise trans and queer, and I make mistakes around people's names, pronouns, and different stuff, uh, language and, and all the time. Um, the most important thing is just to name it, be accountable that we made a mistake, uh, reaffirm the person's identity, or make sure that we clear it up, and then quickly move on. We don't necessarily need to belabor the point, but at the same time, what's really important about mistakes as allies, as service providers, is that we learn from them and that we bring that into our teachings and our moving forward, making sure that when we're working with people that we just get better and better at that. If we are afraid to make mistakes and so we don't reach out, it often leads to isolation of somebody who might be in need. So I think it's really important that we try our best to give ourselves a little self-care if we make mistakes, do our best then to be accountable and grow in our, our learnings and moving forward. There was a resource um, article called Transitioning Our Shelters that came out in 2003 that really talks about including trans folks in shelters, but I think it's really applicable to a lot of different services. Um, and basically a policy within it said is people should be treated according to their self-identified gender. It's the policy of respect. Um, and this comes to when we're speaking to people in terms of the language we use, the names that we use. If someone says my name is Gwen, even though on my ID it might still say it's legally something different, be in relationship with the person and use the language that honors and respects their identity. This also comes to when we're thinking about our policies or policy updates, when we're thinking about space updates or retrofits, can we create spaces that are accessible for trans or gender diverse folks? They don't have to have extra barriers to access a space or a program or a service if um, they're trying to access it. So thinking about that in terms of any type, type of policy intake forms, the language we use, services we provide, programming we provide, if it's gender segregated and if it needs to be gender segregated, is it also trans inclusive? Now the term cisgender you may have heard or may not have heard, cis is Latin for aligned on or the same side of. So if somebody is born in a way that um, the doctor at birth perceives them to have a male body, um, they're assigned male at birth, they grow up in a way that uh, their body develops in a way that we perceive as male, and at that later in life they're like, yes, I'm still male, then everything aligns in a way that society would expect it to. So that's cis, aligned on, the same side of. So I, Gwen, am somebody who was assigned male at birth, uh, my body developed in a way that people would expect it to, but I identify as female. So I transgress that binary of male and female, so transgender. So cisgender, transgender, binary in a sense, but what I really like about the term cisgender is it notes that everybody has a gender identity. It's just that most of us don't have to stop and think about it. If we're born with a difference of sex development or intersex condition, or if we're trans, we may have to think about how our gender identity in our brain is different than how our body developed. But most of us don't have to think about it. The second thing I like about the term cisgender is it just denotes the fact that most policy, programming, and space design is based solely on cisgender experiences of the world. So if we think about washrooms, or single stall washrooms, often they're labeled male and female, but the reality is, is there a single stall washroom? Does it really matter? And so if we take those signs off and just put washroom, it actually liberates all of us. We don't have to wait in lines while the other washroom is empty and so forth. So think about how if, for instance, I often like to use an analogy of a non-binary youth, so a youth that doesn't identify as male or female, it's somewhere in the spectrum of gender, 
tribe group, but it's very dependent on services, on guardians or parents. How do they navigate the world? If they see a, a washroom access that's around a lot of public, and one science is male and female, when they access that washroom, they're kind of outing themselves to the people around them. People who didn't care about their gender before, they start to feel like their gender is an issue that they feel that they have a beef with and that they might want to let that youth know about. So recognizing that some folks, especially very uh, vulnerable folks, may have invisible barriers that we're not aware of, and how can we make reduce those barriers so people actually access our services and are anxious to actually come. Now some of you may have seen the genderbred person, maybe you have not, check it out online. The genderbred person is a very good way of just talking about different aspects of all of us people and how we're diverse from each other. Even if we identify as straight, cisgender, female, or male, that doesn't mean everyone who's straight, cisgender, or female has the same identity and the same way of walking through the world. So just recognize that we all have a gender identity whether we stop to think about it or not, which is our brain and how we innately think of ourselves. I think of myself as female. Um, we have a, our gender expression, how we express our gender, and that changes over our, the course of our life. If you think about how your parents or guardians dressed you when you are younger, how you dress yourself in middle high school or junior high school, how you dress nowadays, it may have shifted a lot. Me as a trans person who um, told myself I'd never talk about it, definitely erred on the side of expressing myself as male, masculine and androgynous for most of my life until I finally came out as female and at a point in time transitioned that to more expressing femininity so people would read me as female. It's been 18 years since I've come out. I'm older now. I have a lot of safety around me. I care a lot less what people think about my gender identity. So my gender expression is a lot more fluid. Sometimes I feel like I express myself more like the actress Tilda Swinton. Sometimes I think I express myself more like David Bowie. Um, it's fluid and I've had the safety to do that. But recognize that's not true for all trans folks. And also recognize that sometimes trans folks especially kids who have, are dependent on many different um, um, communities around them, whether that be school, whether that be their family, whether that be their place of worship, their uh, different community centers, may shift their gender expression based on where they're going that day, just to make sure that they're not outed and that they continue to be belonged by the, the communities that they are a part of. Um, biological sex, as we know, um, many people are XY chromosome, XX chromosome. Some folks have differences in sex development, maybe XXY chromosome, or have androgen insensitivity syndrome, AIS, where they are XY chromosome, but because their body doesn't process testosterone, may actually develop what we perceive as a female body. So recognizing nature does like some diversity in biological sex, it's our constructs, social constructs that often don't. Um, and then romantic orientation and sexual orientation, those are different for all trans folks. It's just like anyone who is, is um, cisgender as well. Some folks may identify as straight, some may, folks may identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, asexual, and so forth. So just because we know somebody's trans doesn't mean we know anything about their romantic orientation, sexual orientation, or, or other aspects of who they are. So just not make assumptions about folks. Now, this gender bed person has gone through different variations, including other folks, um, trans folks, creating a gender unicorn, which actually talks about this much more complex and just recognizes the fact that people can have expressed things that are perceived as androgynous, feminine, and masculine at the same time. But there are folks who are romantically attracted to both men and women, or maybe just sexually attracted to one gender, but romantically attracted to women, men, and trans folks as well. So these are both online, check them out at some point. We find that they're really useful to talking to folks who don't necessarily have the language yet around unpacking gender identity versus gender expression and biological sex. And we also find they're really helpful when talking to parents who might not understand what their youth is going through. Now, terminology around trans folks keeps changing all the time. Youth keep coming up with new words. So anything I'm showing you right now is probably three months out of date. I do apologize, but I just want to let you know that there's a lot of different words. And again, that policy of respect. When someone tells you, like myself, says, hi, my name is Gwen, and I identify as trans, then honor the words that I use, mirror those back, and build that relationship with the person. You might meet somebody who identifies and says, hey, my name is... A Gwen and I identify as non-binary. And then their de description of what non-binary means might sound similar to what uh, my description of what trans means. Um, that doesn't mean that we should say, well, it's the same description, so I'll just use trans. Don't do that. Use the language that people use to describe themselves. So if someone comes to you and says, I'm non-binary, respect and mirror back that language because you're building relationship with that person who might be very hesitant to access healthcare services. And if you are somebody who's non-judgmental and witnesses who they are, you might be that point person that helps them opting back into healthcare. Um, if you see the, the screen that I have now, you see trans is bolded and non-binary are bolded. Um, the reason I did that is because those are kind of terms when you're thinking about an umbrella terms to talk about a population as a whole. Trans, for folks who identify as um, female, 
non-binary and male who are folks who are, are, uh, have gone through any kind of social or medical transition, trans is a word that encompasses that. When you're talking about people who don't identify necessarily as male or female, but somewhere in the constellation or spectrum of gender diverse folks, non-binary is a word that's often used nowadays. But again, if you're talking about an individual, um, that policy of respect, hear what the language people use to talk about themselves and mirror that back. Now, two points I want to make about that. If people share that with you, make sure that you connect with them about confidentiality, about whether or not you should share that with others in your workspace, if you're advocating outside the workspace or elsewhere. The second thing I want to point out is that um, not all people who access medical transition or social transition are out about trans or identify as trans. So some people may access a medical transition, go through all of it, and then just identify as male afterwards or just identify as female afterwards. So again, honor people's identity and, and try your best to work with them and not accidentally out them. I'm very quickly gonna speak to this because we don't have a lot of time, but I just think it's important to note two things. First, it's great to learn about two-spirit people, but most likely best to learn from about two-spirit people from two-spirit people and from indigenous communities. And the second thing I wanna state is the fact that words like trans, non-binary are more recent terms that we're learning about. Some people will say, well, non-binary, that's such a millennial thing. It's not. Gender diverse people have existed throughout the world, throughout times, and with the internet in the last 10, 20 years, we're having more and more awareness of the different gender diverse folks that have existed throughout history, and more of a cultural resurgence, especially in North America around two-spirit people, recognizing that hundreds of nations have welcome gender diverse people into their communities and belong them and have um, and had roles for them long before colonization and it was with the colonization that we had the suppression of that knowledge um, and but we're learning more and more about it today something that i think is really important to note is that we don't get I myself don't get to identify, say someone's two-spirit, they say it themselves. So I might know someone who's indigenous and lesbian, um, that's not for me to say, oh, you're two-spirit. The person gets to say if they're two-spirit or not and honor that. It's different from person to person to person. Second, I'm somebody who has um, Western European ancestry and no indig indigenous ancestry. So I can learn a lot from two-spirit teachings. A lot may resonate with me, but it's not for me to co-opt that that, 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 that identity it is a sacred indigenous identity that's different from nation to nation to nation. And it's for me to be an imperfect ally in solidarity with indigenous and two-spirit people. Um, gender transition, there's lots of ways of looking at it. Some people think transition is, 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 is more of an outdated term and it, it may be, but I think we haven't found a term yet that really, really um, um, works and it's more honoring of different people's um, um, journeys nowadays. So I will say gender journey for now because some people's gender journey doesn't access medical um, 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 surgery or hormones. Um, some people's does. Some people's just has a social transition. Some people have a bit of both. So what I want to make a distinction about is medical transition is often about accessing medical care, whether it's hormones and or surgeries. Um, social transitions are the things that we do in our lives um, to shift the way that people read and honor how we identify. So many people may not want to actually access medical transition. Some people may want to, um, um, but aren't able to, and so then therefore rely on just social transition. Now, social transitioning is all ways of shifting the way that we express ourselves in the world. It might be our clothing, it might be our mannerisms, the way we use our voice, and so on, right? Medical transition, again, may be hormones and surgeries. And just making that distinction, because there's many people out in the world, thinking of youth, thinking about people living in poverty, thinking about people who have unstable housing conditions, who may not have the ability to access social transition. There may be also things about worry about losing family, their community of faith, their employment, the place they work, different kind of barriers to be able to be fully who they are in the world. Gender diversity, just recognize that there's lots of folks um, who are on their own different gender journeys. And there's a lot of folks who um, don't identify as male or female, but somewhere in that spectrum or constellation of non-binary identities. Um, and that it, it's not just a matter of, not, of questioning and not knowing, it may be that they identify, and very often is they identify as non-binary, and they have no intention of ever moving into a place where people perceive them specifically as male or only as male or as female. So recognize that it isn't a, just an identity of being in flux, but from Many people it is their identity as non-binary. Um, there's a map on this screen that shows gender diverse cultures. If you go to the PBS website of Independent Lens um, and look at for a documentary called Two Spirits, which I recommend watching as well, you'll find this interactive map and those blue dots will talk to you about a lot of different gender diverse cultures that have existed and or do exist now around the world. Um, so just wanting to recognize that a person's 
Gender may be binary, non-binary, or fluid. There's variations and degrees where people socially and or medically transition. And again, gender expression is not necessarily linear. People may shift their expression um, as they move through the world in order to make sure they're safe and are belonged by the communities that are important to them. And that includes work as well as family and school and so forth. Coming out and being outed. Coming out is voluntary, being outed is involuntary. Um, even coming out is a staggered process. So I might come out to somebody or a service provider, but it doesn't mean I'm out to the other service providers, my family or so forth. So if someone comes out to you, um, thank them, recognize it's a gift that they're sharing with you something so deep and vulnerable and personal, but also make sure to check in to recognize to what extent are they out to other people or not. Just recognizing when people are inadvertently outed, and that often happens with their electronic medical uh, records, also when people go into um, um, emergency centers, um, that that can violate confidentiality, and it also has many risks, including potentially being fired, losing housing, quality of care going down, being socially ostracized, violence, and death. There's a Transgender Day of Remembrance, which is every November 20th, and on that day we hear about hundreds of people who've been murdered that year. We don't know about the people who um, were murdered that we were not aware of, the people who were br brutally beaten, the people that are suffering in silence, victims of suicide and so forth, but on that list there's always a few hundred people, and every year, without doubt, there's a disparity of who's on that list. It isn't just folks who are experiencing transphobia, but it's folks who are experiencing transphobia, sexism, racism, and poverty. So I'm gonna go into some bummer stats and try to keep it quick because I know we only have so much time, but I'm sure most of you know about the different thing, uh, aspects of social determinants of health and how they can compromise people's health and community's health outcomes. Um, There's a study in Ontario that looked at trans folks, 433 folks over 16 and over, and they found that 49% of them made less than 15,000 per year. If you think of living in, in places off of 15,000 per year, it can be pretty hard. Even if you can do it, it can com compromise the choices you have in terms of housing, uh, nutritional value, in terms of um, um, accessing counseling, fitness centers, and so forth. So recognizing that people who are dealing with poverty um, may have a lot of constrained access to choice. And if you're also somebody who's visibly trans, there might be discrimination against you because of your gender diversity. So that starts to make us think about intersectionality. And this is a very quick way of saying it, but Kimberly Crenshaw talked about intersectionality and how intersecting stigmas influence and amplify one another. So if someone is experiencing, like Kimberly Crenshaw, racism and sexism, those don't happen independently. They don't just act compound like one plus one equals two, but they actually significantly influence and amplify one another. One example in Canada that I want to speak to is thinking about homelessness and how 20% of youth, uh, the homeless population is youth. But when we look at the, that population of youth, we also recognize that 29.5% of them are LGBTQ identified, 30.6% identify as Indigenous, 28.2% um, identify as racialized minorities. So we're looking at potential racism, colonialism, along with poverty, along with the vulnerabilities and, and unlimited access to being a, a homeless youth. So again, intersectionality impacts folks. And the best study I know for trans folks is an American study called Injustice at Every Turn. Um, it had 6,450 different folks that were part of that study. They looked at the folks who were African American and trans, they found significant impacts to their social determinants of health. 41% experienced homelessness, 15% had been physically assaulted at work, 50% um, had faced harassment in education. And then the one that, in being involved in healthcare, the one that really um, hits me hard is thinking about the HIV rates. The general population at the time between 2009 and 2011 in the States was 0.6% who identified as HIV positive. If you're part of the African American communities or the trans communities, two to 3% identified as being HIV positive. But for the folks that identified as trans and African American, their communities were 20.2% likely to be HIV positive. And that's not due to poor choice. That's due to limited access or compromised access to dignifying care and different services that people can be safe and themselves within and not experience transphobia or racism or all the different things that impact their well-being. So how do we split that thing out, uh, that, that stat? And my big message would be that when we address um, access for gender diverse folks in, in, in our services, what we're really doing is combating homophobia, trans um, uh, racism, poverty, stigma against uh, mental health, poverty, um, substance use, and so forth. So protective factors that we found in Canada, youth with supportive family relationships are four times less likely to self-harm and to consider suicide. They're four times more likely to report good or excellent mental health. Um, we know that if parents aren't there for youth, um, that if you have non-judgmental other adults in your life, it does increase self-esteem and happiness. Um, and then that youth in a, a nationwide 
trans youth survey that was put out by the Stigma Against and Resilience Amongst Vulnerable Youth Centers, Sarabic, at the UBC School of Nursing, said that youth reported that using their correct names and pronouns, regardless of what is on their ID, the ones that they actually use, um, really helped them felt supported in that environment. That being able to live in their felt gender, a sense of belonging to the communities that were involved in, and parent and family connectedness was a super important factor. So thinking about how we can support families also in supporting their youth is really big. Now I want to go to some policy of practice. And again, I think I want to say is that multi-pronged approaches really help. So think about if you're changing a policy, how you can do some education at the same time, how you can have some signage or some sort of um, things that make this visible, both to service users and service providers. Think about the language we use with people, the language on forms, um, what questions we ask on forms, are they relevant questions to ask, why, why are they relevant, and make sure that we're transparent about this to the people that are accessing our services. Now, education, there's a number of different places you can go in, 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 in Canada. Transcare BC is a great resource for us here in BC, and we'll have more education there and on the Learning Hub in time. Trans Rights BC is an initiative that was created a few years ago between VCH, now PHSA, um, the Catherine White Home and Wellness Centre, and the BC Law Foundation. And if you go there, there's um, lots of different information on 10 different subsections around the legal rights of trans and gender diverse people in BC, including, including healthcare, housing, employment, um, immigration, and so forth. Um, Rainbow Health Ontario has some wonderful stuff there and the 519 Centre also in Ontario and there's a number of different sites across Canada that can help for folks, their families um, and service providers. At Transcare BC we have three main um, uh, focuses that we're really focusing on and that's peer and community support across the province and we have um, uh, coordinators in the northern health region on, and on the island and BCH now we hope to have some more in Fraser Health um, and in the interior in time. Um, we're looking at addressing a primary care access in all different regions to make care closer to home for everybody and thinking about the surgical and medical support at this point in time and how we can um, make streamlined pathways and also have um, more intense specialized players care closer to home within the province. And in all three of these um, um, columns there's also education that's connected to that. We have the Trans Primary Care Toolkit for GPs and MPs on our Transcare BC site now, so you can go and take a look at that. And if you're working with people who are thinking about accessing surgeries, we also have some forms around um, what surgeries need assessments, whether they need a single assessment, two assessments, or, or no assessments at all. Um, there's also access to our care coordination team that, on our site, um, which is great to call. And also, if you're a primary care provider and want to know more, there's a twice monthly call um, that you can call to the care coordination team to, to go to. I believe it currently um, is Dr. Mary Townsend, our medical director, who is on that call. Also, the race line, the rapid access and consultative expertise line, has a very a, a, a trans focus there too. So if you go there and you and you access the trans care um, um, subsection, you usually get a call back within minutes, if not within the day. Um, it's mostly for GPs and MPs, but other folks call it now and again. Um, the care providers call it now and again as well. Um, thinking about the questions we ask people, um, I didn't create this, this is um, from the web, but if you're outside and you see somebody and you have questions on their gender, if it's irrelevant, don't worry about it, right? Now, we're care providers mostly, and sometimes we do have to ask personal questions. So when we do do that, we do think it's important to think about knowing why we're asking those questions and telling the folks why we're asking those personal, which can be perceived invasive questions. So know why you're asking the question. What kind of information do you need from the person? Is the question asked in a way that will get you the information you actually need? Are you asking the question in a caring and gender affirming or gender neutral way? We often will ask in a gender neutral way if we don't know how someone identifies or the gender of their partner or so forth, right? Once we know, then we mirror back the language people use to identify themselves or their relationships with others. Um, and then tell why you're asking the question. Tell the person why you're asking the question, what information you need from them, and who will know their answer. When you tell folks and they understand why you're asking the question, they're more willing often to tell you why and not feel apprehensive or cryptic about their answers. Often people will use gender neutral language when they're speaking back to you because they are uh, not wanting to um, offer information up before they need to. Um, often we don't realize they're using gender neutral language. Sometimes people will say, well, I never have any trans people in my service or program. But often it's because they're very, very skilled at like, avoiding using language 
or using inaccurate language by saying, um, I identify as he, when I actually identify she, but I'm not gonna share that, or that my partner is he, even though it's um, someone who identifies as female, um, because I don't wanna, I think it's irrelevant here and now, but at the same time, I'm starting to practice more and more about um, avoiding telling you the full truth because I'm afraid that you will not necessarily accept who I am and that you'll compromise care if I do tell you. So recognize when we create um, in safer, non-judgmental sites that people are more willing when they build trust with us to then disclose more what's going on for them and then we can really address what's really creating the side effects that are impacting their lives. When you're asking questions, I often suggest, again, ask relevant questions. Ask them in ways that are actually res respectful. So I often ask, suggest people ask consent that's just transparent. So for instance, hey Gwen, can I ask you a personal question about the pronouns you use? That's transparent, as opposed to saying, hey, go ahead, can I ask you a personal question? Then I don't know what I'm consenting to, and I can be, feel anxious. So to ask transparently, then ask respectfully, and then just clarify afterwards. If this is information you can share with other people you're working with, with other agencies if you have to advocate outside of that, or with other people in my life if you're talking to my parents or my loved one or so forth. They, them, there in the singular has been grammatically correct for hundreds and hundreds of years. And in fact, in 2016, I believe the American Dialect Society made it their word of the year. They, them, there, not for just unknown individuals, but for known individuals. Many gender um, non-binary folks, again, folks who don't identify, who don't identify, identify as female or male, uh, they, them, there is their pronoun. It's the pronoun they use. Um, so they recognize that it is their pronoun and be able to use it. And the fact is most of us do actually use they, them, their in the singular quite often. It's just often for an unknown person. Look, someone forgot their thermos. They left it here. We might as well put it on the shelf and when they come back, we can give it to them. It's only when we actually see them that we start trying to unconsciously think about, oh, she, she, her, her, or he, him, his, or we stumble over um, um, pronouns. So really think about using they, them, they're listening there for known individuals as well, especially when we're talking about uh, of somebody um, in the hypothetical. And the better we get at using that, the more likely we can use it when we meet somebody and use it as a service tool when we're asking them for, about their partner. Do you have a partner? Are they in town? That leaves room for them to self-identify and disclose. They might not disclose because they might not, not feel safe yet, but they may hear it, especially if you use gender neutral language until you actually use the language that, until they disclose and then you use the language that reflects that respectfully. But if I'm a trans individual and I don't want to come out to you and you're using gender neutral language, then I use gender neutral language, and then you use gender neutral language, and then I use gender neutral language, you bet I'm starting to pick up on the fact that you're somebody who's non judgmental. But as a service provider, think of it as a tool that you can use until you know how someone identifies and then mirror back that language respectfully. And it won't just be trans individuals, but lesbians, gays, bi's, trans, queer folks, as well as their partners, their family members, and so forth, who will pick up on these um, cues that you give. So think about that as a, as a tool. Language. Use the name and pronouns people use to identify themselves. Use gender affirming terms and languages that respect the person's identity. If unknown, use gender neutral language and tell you no, and only ask in a confidential space where it's, when it's relevant to ask and ask respectfully. If you make mistakes, and we all do, I mis make mistakes all the time, as I said earlier, apologize briefly, use the correct name and pronouns, and then move on. So if you were to say, oh, that Gwen, he talks really fast. Oops, sorry, she talks really fast and then move on. Don't make a big deal about it where other people have to or other service providers have to, or service users have to like take care of you. They're their service provider. It's okay, it's okay. Just move on. Also, I think it's really important that if we make mistakes, um, that we own it. Um, we often hope that a person doesn't hear it, but very often they do hear it. And if we do it, especially more than once, it becomes an elephant in the room. And if different folks leaving might have different feelings about, was that a respectful place? Did I feel witness for who I am? Will I go back to that place? Um, forms, if we have intake forms or any other kind of forms, or when we think about talent acquisition for our employees, do they have places for people to self-identify? Do we need to know their legal name? If we do, then we put it down, but then also perhaps name use. So maybe for many different reasons, people have a different name that they use than their legal name, including trans folks. So if we can put that down, it lets people put, fill that in if they use it already, but it also lets people who might not be out know, or their parents or their families know that this is a place that 
is trying to be respectful of gender diverse folks. And maybe it's that parent that says, wow, this is a place that's thinking about it. My child has opted out of care for a long time because of a negative experience. I'm going to champion this service as a place that my child comes and tries to access. So realize that, again, it's another visual cue to folks that this might be a place that's really trying. So think about that. If you need to get biological sex or legal sex also written down, think about ways that you can also let people self-identify. Perhaps also put down gender in a blank line or pronouns people use. She, her, hers, he, him, his, or they, them, theirs. Um, it allows people to recognize that this is a place that's trying. They may never come out to you about a gender identity, but they might be also be struggling something with something else that's stigmatized, like their mental health. And maybe this is a place where they feel that they can talk about it. And if they accidentally talk about their gender identity, that you're not going to be suddenly judgmental about them and then compromise the care. If you need boxes, and I know statisticians often need boxes or agencies that have a lot of funding need boxes, um, I really, really recommend that you create um, a, something like this where you also have a box for trans. I don't think you necessarily need 18 different boxes for all the different terminology, but if you have that and also check all that apply, that allows people to give you a more three-dimensional understanding of who they are. If I can check woman and trans, then you know that I'm somebody who is trans, and so I'm part of the demographic that accesses your services, so we should think about that in the future, but also that I am trans feminine. Someone else might check trans and man, and so that's someone who's trans masculine, and someone who is a trans masculine person may have very different needs than someone who's a trans feminine person, right? I also always like it when there's a space for people can just to write down their identity, um, but if you don't have, if you just have boxes, please consider having check all that apply. Policies, think about if you have anti-discrimination policies, policies and think about adding gender expression and gender ident identity in that. It's now in our BC, um, um, BC um, government's pol I, Charter of Human Rights. I, 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 know I'm get, or, I know I'm getting that wrong, but also on the federal level, um, again, um, gender identity and gender expression is included in there and the criminal code. So now think about adding that into your anti-discrimination policy. Many organizations, including BC Corrections, have a trans inclusion policy specifically. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Look at the different agencies out there that are similar to your agencies and see what they have and then work on that or enhance it for your own agency. And policies do help. This is from EGAL, Equality for Gays and Lesbians Everywhere, looking at schools that have anti-homophobia policies compared to schools that don't. And I found that schools that have anti-homophobia policies have youth are more willing to report incidents, teachers and staff are more likely to intervene effectively, and of course they are because they have guidelines, they have their schools backing, their principals backing, their school districts backing, and then because they feel belonged by these communities and supported and their steam is higher, youth are more likely to talk to their parents about what's going on. And if parents have a negative reaction or just unsure how to support, they have a, a, the school community, the counselors, the teachers to talk to that can help them get connected to resources or parent groups to help the parents come along and support their children and help that their health outcomes. Physical spaces, thinking about your spaces, most spaces aren't gendered, but some definitely are, and there might be good reasons why they are gendered, but how can we make them trans-inclusive so people who don't necessarily fit in those, uh, or who aren't cisgender or who are visibly trans, aren't always falling through the cracks and not being involved in that, uh, those services. There was a study in 2009 called Invisible Men out of Toronto. It was a qualitative study. I talked about how trans masculine folks who had access shelters before, 61% of them stated they wouldn't access shelters again, they would rather sleep outside. What is going wrong when people choose to sleep outside rather than accessing shelters? So thinking about how we can make our resources, even if they're gender segregated, trans inclusive to folks. And that means if we have a space that's specifically for, trans, uh, for women, that it's not just for trans women, but think about trans masculine folks who may experience sexualized violence as folks who were perceived as female, who may be still struggling, who may have not transitioned physically, and so therefore read as a female in the world, they might decide that a, a place that is more for um, around tra uh, women and trans inclusion might be the place to go more than a place that's more for men. They might not feel as safe. Some might feel very safe and choose that place, but let's make that choice for the people who would rather opt out of care if they can't have choice in terms of where they go. Um, this image of a person in front of two washroom doors or change rooms doors is very common for lots of different folks and their experience of harassment or physical threats and or actual physical violence in different space, gendered spaces. So recognizing quite often people will just not bother going out as long as their body will allow, if uh, the bladder will allow, if they um, are worried about actually finding a place to pee in peace. Um, Youth often won't drink juice or water at school just to avoid the washroom and bullying because of that. On the right, there's an image of a interactive um, a tool that's been that someone designed so that trans folks can talk about where they were able to access urban centers and PMPs. Awesome that someone created a bummer that it needs to exist. Um, 
Here is a washroom in a bus terminal in Prince Rupert. You can see there's two single stall washrooms at the end of this room. Um, one's labeled male, one's labeled female. You can see there's lots of seats. Now, if you're a, a non-binary youth who's dealing with anxiety, but your bladder is full and you're in this space and there's lots of other people, there's a good chance no one's caring about your gender until you access one of those spaces that has a male or female sign. And then often people will make it their business after that to let you know how they're disgraced you are by your gender expression or who you are. Now, this bus terminal goes to an airport that takes you places. Places. This bus terminal, you get onto the bus, which takes you onto a ferry. The ferry takes you to an island where you then go onto a small plane that takes you to Prince George or Vancouver. This means you have many hours that you're spent with these people who are now not very happy with who you are in the world. So recognizing that things like this, this male and female sign, are barriers that might be invisible to most of us, but to those folks. So think about your washrooms and think about your forms and different things that might actually impact people in ways that we don't realize, right? If you have intake forms in your reception room and you don't have a place for a name used, then often people end up calling up legal names to folks who are, who are trans and use different names or, um, and out them in that waiting room in front of a bunch of other people. So think about ways that we can reduce barriers to people actually getting to the care providers who might really be awesome, but are behind a few different barriers that often keep people away. So think about your washroom signs. If you have single stall washrooms, just make them non-gendered. It liberates those washrooms for all of us. We, most of us have to wait in less lineups if we have different single stall washrooms that are not gendered. If you have multi-stalled washrooms uh, and that's it and you can't change that, think about at least having a sign like the middle sign that says trans people welcome or trans inclusive. I don't need to know that myself as a trans person, but somebody who hasn't thought about trans issues before, when they see that sign, they know that they shouldn't be a gender policing jerk when they enter that place. If somebody is doing, using the washroom appropriately, leave them alone no matter what they look like, right? Um, so think about that in terms of your spaces. The middle sign is from PHSA's corporate site. So we are actually implementing this in health cares. I've seen these signs at VCH as well. So think about that in terms of your services as well. Um, here's some more different signs that you can use. So every, every site has different contexts and different things that they need. So think about what signs may work for you and realize that you don't have to start from scratch. There are many different plan, pl templates out there that you can search on the web. Um, also with change rooms, think about how you can have changed spaces that are not necessarily gendered um, and making sure that you can think about the ergonomics in terms of flow. This is an image from Vancouver Parks Board and they thought about how families use the universal change room but also how individuals use an ch individual change room in, in busy area, busy times of days. Sometimes families will pit their needs against individual people and say, why are you here when I have three screaming children um, who are wet and cold? So think about all the different folks who need to access um, private spaces for different body reasons and how you can help make sure that people aren't pitted against each other and you can help with flow. So Vancouver Parks uh, Board has recommended that they have bigger stalls for families as well as smaller stalls for singles. So in those busy high um, 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 use times that people filter based on the size of the stall and are not in competition with each other to the same degree. Think about signage and posters that you may have in your spaces. This is from, again from the Vancouver Parks Board. Um, it's signage they put up when they were introducing their policy and, and changing some of the, the different signage. They put these posters up to help make sure not just that staff know about it, but also that serve, um, users of the Vancouver Parks Board recognize that we are um, changing the rec um, um, some of the stuff to be more close to the trans and gender diverse folks um, and try to make everybody all become more on board and champion this and help work together to make it succeed. In Vancouver, we also have another nonprofit. It's called Our City of Colors, and they have created a bunch of posters that let folks know that people from different ethnocultural communities identify as lesbian, gay, and bi, and they're and trans. And then there's two spirit folks out there who are part of our indigenous communities. And that intersectionality and our multi multifaceted identities are something that should be celebrated, not something that should always be barriers uh, that create stigma and uh, impact our access to healthcare for folks. So thinking about ways that in your um, reception areas or places that you have posters, that you make sure that you reflect the different diversity of different folks that are there. People often find those rainbow stickers or trans flags are really helpful if they're on offices or if they're in the space for folks who are part of those communities to then therefore start to seek out to see who might be a, an ally, an imperfect ally in the space that they can talk to about what's really going on for them in, in their life. Think about assessment tools that may also be out there or audit tools that can be helpful for your spaces. The one on the left is the Vancouver Parks Board 73 recommendations for uh, changing um, um, some stuff to be more accessible. They have change rooms, they have washrooms, they have intake forms, they have policies, they have programming. Um, so a lot of that stuff is transferable. It might be need to be altered or changed based on the services that you provide, but they, 
again, don't start from scratch. You can use stuff that people have uh, created before. And the one on the right is the Vancouver Coastal Health Downtown East Side Second um, Strategy a Washroom um, um, Accessibility. So it looks at folks who are trans and gender diverse, looks at folks who are substance, doing substance use, folks who are um, um, struggling with homelessness and so forth. Again, these are tools that can be really helpful for you to look at um, your own site and thinking about how to make things more accessible for trans and gender diverse folks. Um, that is my last slide, and I don't know how far we are into this, but I'm assuming we're around the 40 minute mark. So I'm wondering at this point in time if folks have questions. And again, I'll just state um, um, those two questions that I asked you at the very beginning. How does what I've just been talking about apply to your work site in terms of client access if you have someone there um, access who may be out about their identity? And for those who are not out and may need signs that this is a non-judgmental safer space to address what may be going on for them. And secondly, how many struggles around self-acceptance and social acceptance impact folks who are gender diverse and their relationship to their body? Thank you. Hi, Lauren. Hi. We don't have any questions yet. No worries. I'll be right back on the screen. I'm just going to grab something that tells me time. Okay. Okay, so the question is, I have a transgender client um, slash youth. Oh, here we go. Transition, transitioned from male to female about two years ago. Very supportive family. Met a lot of trans folks. I tried to... I tried to encourage her to connect with other people who have walked that route. She attended some groups, met people, but unfortunately it did not have a positive effect. She's a very vulnerable youth, got a lot of suggestions how she can work in the sex industry, porn industry, camming. I got concerned. Are there any mentors you know of who would be positive role models she would be able to talk to and how to navigate dating careers? Um, absolutely. So um, two points that come out of that. Um, definitely before um, the last 10 years, uh, especially before the internet, there has been limited access for folks to meet other communities and have other possibility models. For a lot of trans folks of all genders, but um, definitely for folks who identify more on the as female or on the more feminine side of the gender spectrum, um, Sex, survival sex work has been something that has been a way for folks to often continue to work whether um, um, they get lots of money or whether they're underemployed but getting by um, when they're not necessarily, when we're not necessarily accepted within um, different um, um, career paths. Even for folks who have many years of experience working there and are experts in their field, often once folks would come out, um, they're not necessarily welcome so much anymore. So that is starting to change, but that also I must state that there's lots of areas for folks and it's not just rurally but also in urban centers and so we need to continue to work on not just thinking about people who access their service but how do we make sure that our spaces are welcoming of gender diverse folks as employees um, so that's huge and important I just think I want to name that I think online there are actually a lot of different um, possibility models for folks who have made their their way in the world as doctors, as lawyers, as educators, as filmmakers, as all the different employment that exists. So trying to find representations there is really useful. In terms of connecting to people, there are different um, ways through Facebook and social media and uh, forums to connect with people. I would recommend also thinking about connecting to our health navigator team. Many of the folks on our health navigator team um, are part of the trans community, are folks who have worked for years as um, youth support workers, working with trans youth, working with um, LGBTQ and two-spirit youth. Um, we run a trans youth drop-in in the Vancouver area as well. 
Um, but there's a number of coordinators in, again, the Vancouver Island Health Authority area, the North, Northern Health area, um, and other folks in the Kootenays. There's a great person out of Anchors um, who um, all do great work and connect people with other really awesome people in, in, um, that would be helpful for them moving forward. Um, but if there's no one else, I would really recommend, again, either contacting me through the, um, the email that's up or kind of connecting with our trans health navigators so you'll see up there this trans care bc general email as well as the uh, toll free line um if you connect with them they will definitely get you connected to folks on our team who are very much tapped into and working with youth support across the the, the um the the province as well as the ability to talk one-on-one -on -one with, with an individual if they want that okay thank you. another question is hi gwen any suggestions for resources for families um, absolutely. Um, two things that come to mind. First, Transcare BC is now working with some um, family groups across the province. There's, I think, four sites, so it's not in every health region so far. But again, if you connect with the, go to the general email, Transcare BC, and ask about that, the na health navigators and our peer community coordination team will be able to connect you to the different things that exist out there. Um, also, there's gendercreativekidscanada.ca, which is a site that's really about families supporting their youth as well. Out of the um, Central Toronto Youth Services, if you look online, you'll find a art, uh, if, you, if you Google search or whatever search engine you use, CTYS and Families in Transition. There is a wonderful PDF out there. There's a, it's version two now, that talks about um, parents supporting their um, youth um, and, and, and things that parents often are, uh, uh, come across or apprehensions or ways to connect and, and support. Um, also, in terms of, in the States, another really great site that um, someone I know recommends many parents to um, is genderspectrum.org. That's another great site as well. But in Canada, gendercreativekidscanada.ca gender um, is, is a good site, but also connect with our team again. Um, are we going to have a, a copy of the PowerPoint from the desk? Um, I do hope so. I, I, I thought I saw that it was going to be mailed out, but I, I'm sure Gabriella will, will mail it out sometime in the next few days, and we'll just um, make sure to um, connect there. If for any reason that you, um, if you don't get it, again, just email me and say I would love a copy of the PowerPoint, and I'll make sure to send that to you as soon as possible. Um, this person says, first of all, thank you. I work as a mental health clinician in Smithers. I currently have four gender variant clients. In terms of access, we have the Trans Care Clinic in Prince George for medically transitioning services and readiness assessments. In terms of trans specific healthcare services, do you recommend dealing with being on the wait list for this clinic or would accessing care from a local GP who the client identifies as safe be a good option as well? Um, I, I think both. I think we need more folks that are closer. We need care closer to home everywhere in the province, and we're trying to work on that. We did an assessor training for GPs and MPs in Terrace earlier this, well, I guess last year now. Um, and um, through that, um, folks that lear learned more, I think a few of them may need to still do preceptorships before they start doing more of the work. But I know some folks are doing work, so I think that connecting with, um, again, our health uh, our navigator team would be really useful. We also have a uh, Northern Health Region coordinator that works at the Blue Pine Clinic in Prince George. So connecting with um, um, that person as well would be really useful to connect. But I think that the what we really are hoping to do is get that care closer to home. Um, so I think being on the waiting list is, is great for the time being. But seeing if some of the um, folks that attended the training recently are interested or are doing the work or will be picking it up, I think will be really useful. So I think connecting again, to the Northern Health um, Coordinator of our, on our team um, would be really useful. And you can do that again by connecting to our TransCare team at phsa.ca or to myself, Gwen Howard, at phsa.ca. Thanks, Gwen. Um, I think that's all of the questions. Um, just want to thank you so much, Gwen, for that presentation. It was really informative and I think it gives us lots of really good tools to use. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And again, my apologies for speaking so quickly, but I'm passionate about this. I've had coffee and um, <laughs> Uh, it's just who I am. So I hope you enjoyed it, and thank you so much. And again, thank you so much for the work you already do, the work you're now doing, the work you're doing in the future for folks uh, who are, are struggling with any kind of vulnerabilities or barriers. Uh, it is life-saving, and it's amazing. And as someone who is not out about my gender identity for 22 years, um, who is out now and working with healthcare, I really do appreciate it, and thank you so, so much. So I just want to remind everyone of our next presentation happening February 14th. 
Uh, Dr. Teo Elfers will be presenting on autism spectrum disorders and their link to eating disorders. So please join us for that. Um, and you can also plan, uh, send any further questions or feedback um, you have on these presentations to Gabriella. Thanks very much. Take care. I did a few minutes early. <laughs> I was going to go over, so that's pretty good. Oh, there you go.